I would love for you to break down what project-based learning is not. Okay, so I just I'm just gonna keep shouting out these lovely organizations Go that have it. you know <laughs> set the foundation for me. Uh, it the New Tech Network. It was really a a doing projects versus project-based learning juxtaposition. And at PBO Works, it's emphasized in terms of being main course projects and not dessert. And mm-hmm. so both of them really convey the same message. So it is project-based learning is not, I'm going to teach and front load all this content and then we're going to do something with it. Okay. It's not that. It's actually quite the opposite. We're going to start with what is the something that we're going to do? What is that challenge? to solve what is the you know prototype to build or what is that community partner who needs our help right we like in place-based learning to really anchor in the place so what is that what does whitney plantation need from us they need signage right so starting with the challenge and then anything that you feel like you need to front load or pre-teach bake that in. Now it's part of the learning and it's in service of this challenge. And so that's where the project-based learning begins. Everything Mm -hmm. else is a dessert project that comes at the end or we're just doing projects. And that's okay too, because we can take that stuff and strengthen it and make it more of a deeper learning experience that we desire. So does every project have to have a goal or a challenge? I've seen some projects that are just strictly explorations and, you know, just sharing of results. So, no, it doesn't always have to solve a problem. Sometimes, especially in our place-based learning, we Mm -hmm. encourage not everything is a problem to be solved. Sometimes there are assets to be amplified in the community and bright spots that need to be, you know, shined upon. And so sometimes that's the the challenge. Okay. Now, would... Two people in a group, would that be considered a project-based learning or is that more cooperative? Like, is there, I I guess, a line, like you need at least three people for this to be a project? No, the line in terms of what is considered a project is, is basically, is it what's anchoring the learning or does it come at the end? When we're talking about, you know, what what PBL Works calls gold standard PBL and in place-based learning, you know, we want to make sure it's not, it doesn't have to be, um, I mean, you know, of course, a minimum of one. It could be the entire classroom who's working towards one goal. It's more about the structure of the learning and how how is instruction delivered? How are students experiencing the content? All right. So it sounds like, We can be closer responsive in our practices or our project-based learning if we get to know our students and understand what are their interests, uh, what resonate, what would resonate with them. Uh, I heard also that it is important to consider the the community that you're serving and if there's some things that you can do to support your community as a class. What other pieces do you think we should discuss when it comes to making sure that whatever project-based learning we're we're implementing um, that I haven't touched on already? Oh my God, my most favorite piece is where we kind of take the road less traveled okay. in our place based learning uh, discussion is really two key things the decolonization mm-hmm. of curricula mm-hmm. and more liberatory instructional and assessment practices. So, what does that sound like? What is that, Charity? Those are some really good sounding <laughs> words, hot topics, you know, red alert, red alert, hashtag. <laughs> Liberatory pedagogy, <laughs> hashtag decolonized curricular, right? But they like really is where I get I get fired up around these two things, especially decolonizing curricula, because mm. that means that we are decentering the white perspective that's always uh kind of led education and Mm -hmm. explorations of learning and bringing voices to the table, actually getting students to say whose voices are not heard that were there at the time. Um, It's getting students to the point where when we talk about South Africa and everything is in Afrikaans, I want students to ask, what was this land originally called? Who Mm -hmm. were the people originally here? And I need to know more about them. You know, so those types of things are what happens when we decolonize curricula and we decenter an individualized approach to everything and emphasize the collective. 
Uh, we emphasize uh, as well, not so much, we, we anchor into the ways of knowing. So if we're working with a very, you know, oratory set of people, then we're going to make sure that in decolonizing curricula that we offer more opportunities for those students to be uh, producing things that are more oral and verbal in nature since that is the best way that they express themselves, as opposed to everything being in writing and, you know, not saying, oh, it's not in writing, so it must not be true, you know? <laughs> and so really leaning into those aspects help us to decolonize curricula, which then kind of leads itself to these liberatory teaching practices and assessment practices, such that we're not just bound to quizzes and tests and the traditional mm -hmm. things, those are still very much so present. Direct instruction is very much so present, but it also does a healthy mix of other types of assessment in terms of allowing students, you know, those performance-based assessments and opportunities, you know, for informal and uh, more observ observation-based assessments as well. So just really diversifying our portfolio in terms of how we teach and how we assess is what really, really captures some of that moment. And project-based learning really lends itself to both of those things, decolonizing and liberating. Okay. Well, <laughs> how do, first of all, thank you for that. That, that yeah. was dope. Here, here's a question then, all right? Because you mentioned tests and quizzes are still important. Direct instruction is still important. What are some strategies for assessing students? Because I don't, we haven't talked about that yet. Is it because I think when I think of project based learning, I think of a rubric. Yeah. But I'm wondering on your end, because you mentioned the liberatory side of things, like what are some strategies for the assessment, you know, grading and things like that? Yeah. So a rubric is important so that we can, you know, um, make the assessment process objective and fair, mm -hmm. not a surprise to everyone involved, uh, and very upfront. Sometimes when we launch our projects, we can even launch by and include in the launch a rubric so students know where we're going and, and then know that instruction is going to get you there. When we think of assessment in project-based learning and place-based learning, we really want to make sure that we're thinking of it in a way that empowers and so that means multiple forms of students assessing themselves, leveraging the rubrics, students giving peer to peer feedback, outside guests coming in and maybe focusing in as a community partner on one or two key aspects of the rubric to support students. So assessment is it goes beyond grading, because honestly, if done well, in my most humble opinion and you know, well over 15, almost 20 years of experience that if if done well, assessment and project based learning, by the time we get to the submission of that final product, student, teacher, any community partner that has been involved the entirety of the time, parents along the way, will all be on the same page in terms of what's that grade, because mm. we can say where we've grown according to this rubric, where we still maybe need to grow, but we do have a sufficient answer to whatever that essential or driving question is. So it's it's a, a assessment and project-based learning gets to be that tool that supports what Zaretta Hammond calls a learning partnership. So it's not a tool mm -hmm. for I mean, it does do some evaluation and grade assigning along the way, but it's more or less a tool that helps the learner monitor who and how and what they're learning. And it lets the educator know how to adjust instruction to get them to, you know, that at standard or above uh, part of the rubric. Got you. Okay. All right. Well, listen, again, I always like, I, I enjoy talking to you and I, I'm learning a lot already about project-based learning. And uh, I, I'd love for you to share any final words of advice that you want to provide to our listeners out there. Oh my God, proper planning. And I always like to tell my friends in the workshops I'm facilitating is do your future self a favor and take advantage of all the planning time that is made available to you. Like if, if you're planning a project, try to get as far into that process as you can. So that rollout is just, you know, 
kicking the carpet roll, watching it roll and keeping it on the GPS. That's it. Keeping it on those learning pathways. Um, so really, you know, planning is the most difficult part, but to me, it's not the devil's in the details, but it's like the joy is in the details because I know that what I bake in up front, whether it's too much or, you know, way a lot more than I think I could tackle. I would rather you have way too much to think about because you never know where your students are going to take you on the journey. Um, so really walking in with a really proper, fully fleshed out planning tool uh, is going to do your future self a favor. Hashtag do your future self a favor. That's what I would say. <laughs> All right. Do yourself a future Yes, future self a favor, and and I totally agree. I mean, it's it, it goes without saying. Like we sh we should know this, but you know, I, I think it's really good that you're bringing that up because I think some people think it's the same thing as just doing a regular lesson plan, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a lot more than that when we're doing a project uh, based learning project. So yes, thank Great. you for that.